what we're doing today is we're picking up where we left off. And much of what we'll do today and also next week is interrelated. So we're sort of building, we're building, um, and it's all connected, interrelated, including the readings. And so how have cultural anthropologists tried to theorize about what leads to cultural variation? We're going to talk um, briefly about the history of anthropology, ethnocentric and inaccurate, so that we don't repeat our mistakes. And then we'll get into contemporary approaches, how we sort of do things today. So this is the outline I sort of showed you last time, um, what we'll be covering. And we're gonna get pretty much through it today. So we'll be going in broad strokes, looking at some different theories, a lot of theory, but it's all interesting. And it's so, so relevant to understanding human variation today, this why do we have all this diversity? Um, and so we'll talk about, we're gonna pick up with this notion of complex versus simple societies. That's the way today we often distinguish analytically between different types of societies. The history of anthropology, we're gonna talk about unilineal evolution and we'll get there when we get there, a really inaccurate way to understand human variation. This was corrected by a guy named Franz Boas, sort of the father of American anthropology. He and his idea of historical particularism the way he did things underlies much of how we do anthropology today. And that'll bring us right into contemporary approaches. Two main ones we'll look at, uh, the materialist and the interpretivist approach. Um, that'll lead us into this last sort of theory that we'll talk about, which is postmodernism, interesting stuff. And so you'll note a lot of this, we're reading from Nisa this week, but you read chapter five from Peoples and Bailey. And a lot of this theory, these approaches are covered in that. So just pointing that out to you in case you need a, a reference or you wanna sort of check on something, look something up. How, what are anthropologists terms and concepts for talking about different types of cultures? And one key analytical distinction anthropology is organized around today is this idea of simple versus complex societies. It's not a value judgment. It doesn't mean better, more progressed, superior by any means. Simple refers to societies like the Kunt um, and others we'll talk about throughout the class. They tend to be smaller, smaller populations, face to face. Everyone knows everyone else. They don't really rely on literacy, rather oral tradition and subsistence space, meaning whether they hunt and gather or fish, they provide for themselves. In contrast, complex societies, the US, Sweden, Japan, sort of large industrialized societies, uh, rely on literacy, large populations, so large that it's impersonal, you'll, you'll never really know most of the people that, are, that share your culture, right? And we, we have industrial economies, so not subsistence based, but we're engaged in sort of the cash and the wage economy. You know, we sell our labor or our services or our products on the market for cash, um, and then buy food or whatever else that we need. And so complex, again, doesn't mean better. It means more stuff, more parts. That's what we mean when we say complex versus simple. More people, more specialization. Um, sort of among the Kung, right? A hunter might go hunt and they also might be a healer and they're a parent and they have sort of multiple roles. In our society, we tend to specialize. Some people teach, some people do this, they do that. So complex, more stuff, uh, more people, more parts, more bureaucracy, more steps, more, more parts, and especially more complicated technology. And there's this common misconception that more complex means better, um, especially technology. And there's lots of problems with more complex technology. First of all, most of us can't make anything for ourselves, right? We have to rely on other people to produce it. It breaks. We don't know how to fix it. Um, not to mention sort of the social and environmental costs that go into producing all this stuff, right? All the fossil fuels, the water, the materials, the sort of exploitative labor that goes into making these products so cheap for us to then buy, um, the social effects of the spread of misinformation. So anyways, there's, it's not without its problems. And progress in general, this idea of better, is a really ethnocentric word. Um, it's a value judgment. Progress in relation to what, right? Progress for who? For everyone? Um, for just a few segments of the society? Um, it's a value-laden term, and it's not really useful in talking about cultural variation or biological evolution for that matter. 
from an anthropological perspective, the label complex doesn't mean better. Um, again, this widespread misunderstanding that complexity equals progress. And it, it indeed does not. This famous evolutionary biologist, Stephen Jay Gould, I think he's in the race film even, says evolution in general is not a doctrine of progress. That's not what it's about. Let's talk about evolution in general for a moment. So evolution simply means change over time. Change over time, that's it. And a species, in biological evolution, a species is only well-adapted, fit in an evolutionary sense in relation to the environment in which they live, right? This is essentially what happened to the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs were sort of dominated the globe 200 million years ago and were well-adapted. All of a sudden you have very rapid environmental change, right? A large meteor that likely hit somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico triggered a nuclear winter, um, sort of blocks out the sunlight, kills off the vegetation. Therefore, the herbivorous dinosaurs feeding on that vegetation die and the carnivores feeding on them die, led to this massive extinction event um, because biological evolution moves at a glacial pace and it cannot keep pace with rapid environmental change. And so you're only fit or well adapted in relation to the environment you inhabit. Evolution just means change over time. Could be towards being more well adapted. Um, it could be towards being maladapted. Um, that's an argument some anthropologists actually make about the direction cultural evolution has been headed. Um, sort of decision making has become so concentrated among us that our elites, right, those with the power to make policy that affects all of us, often make decisions that benefit themselves or their wallets, um, but not necessarily the broader society or the environment. And then because they're not negatively affected by those decisions or they're not affected by it so they're unaware, they don't correct for it, right? Sort of maladaptive. Uh, we'll talk about that later. And so in biological evolution um, defined, it's a change in the genetically inherited characteristics of populations over generations, um, specifically changes in allele frequencies. An allele is a gene variant. Um, and so sort of, in two sentences, biological evolution, you have individuals in a population that have advantage, advantageous traits. Um, maybe they have better weaponry, right? Claws or teeth, or they're a little bit faster, or they have um, a mutation in their genes that's changed the color of their fur or skin that camouflages them a little bit better in their environment. These individuals with advantageous traits will survive and reproduce in higher numbers relative to others without those traits, um, eventually passing those on over generations until the whole population starts to resemble those traits, possibly even leading to a new species over long periods of time. We're talking thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. Um, and so that's biological evolution in a, in a nutshell. And after Darwin's theory, sort of uh, mid to late 1800s, on, he published on the origin of species. And at the same time, you have colonialism and Europeans that have been traveling around the world, coming into contact with other people that are very different from themselves. And people started to wonder, well, if different biological life forms could have arisen through this process of change over time, could that also be true for different cultural forms? And so cultural evolution then is uh, the change in characteristics of cultural systems over time. Just recall culture is uh, these shared patterns of thought and behavior that are socially learned and shared among the group and passed down through generations. <clears throat> An adaptation, cultural adaptation in this sense are characteristics and systems that enable human populations to survive and reproduce in their habitats. And so um, cultures often change, adapt to the environment in which they inhabit. And so because different environments present certain opportunities while precluding others, right? Like you're not gonna become um, a fisher person in the middle of the desert is just not an option. The environment presents and precludes certain opportunities. <clears throat> and so different cultural forms have arisen through this process of adapting to their local environments. 
Um, the Inuit, which we'll take a look at a little, they have really specialized techniques and tools for hunting marine life under the sea ice, where they can even find sort of breathing holes, um, all sorts of specialized technology for dealing with that environment. Um, similarly, if you go down to the Amazon in Brazil, the rainforest, there's groups down there that have, they don't have specialized equipment for hunting under the sea ice because there would be no reason for that, but they have other types of adaptations to where they live. Um, they have blow dart guns, right, to sort of shoot poisoned arrows at prey running through the trees, the canopy of the rainforest. And so let's talk about uh, biological evolution and complexity for just a moment. So biologists, uh, including Gould, would say that <clears throat> the history of life, if you look in the fossil record, it looks like life, biology, has become more complex over time. Um, for example, let me just switch over to the whiteboard real quick. This is a, a simplified schematic of the Earth's 4.6, 4.5 billion year history. Um, sorry, it's hard to write on this thing. It takes over a billion years for the first single celled organisms to evolve. Somewhere around, and this isn't quite to scale, 3.4 billion years ago, um, we get the first single celled organisms, prokaryotic cells, bacteria, stuff like that. It then takes over another 2 billion years, again, this is not quite to scale, for the first multicellular organisms to evolve. Things like simple flagellates and sponges and amoebas, just organisms made of more than one cell, like a bacteria. The dinosaurs, don't pop on the scene. And now we're really kind of quite not to scale till about, you know, roughly 250 million years ago, approximate. Um, primates, like the first prosimians, monkeys, and then eventually apes, eventually humans, humans are a primate. They don't pop on the scene till 65 million years ago. And now I'm running out of room. Um, Homo erectus, like archaic Homo sapiens, a couple million years ago. Um, anatomically modern humans, 100,000 years ago, we evolved into our anatomically modern form. Agriculture, farming, doesn't even start until 10,000 years ago. And the way of life that we're used to, um, sort of industrial society, the industrial starts with the Industrial Revolution a little over 250 years ago. Um, and kind of the point is, we're really barely even a dot on the page. And so throughout time, throughout the fossil record, you see this increase in complexity. It's not because evolution has a fixed direction. It doesn't necessarily lead to more complexity. A creature can become more fit in an evolutionary sense by also becoming more simple, less complex. It all depends on the environment that it inhabits. And so this increase in the fossil record in complexity, it's sort of an accident of the fact that life started as simple and therefore it really had only one direction to go. And changes um, that are th like increases in complexity lead to changes that you can see that weren't there before. So it's easier to see things getting more complex. You can't really see things staying simple or becoming more simple. Um, the point, right? more complexity. That's, there's no fixed direction. That's not how evolution works. That's just sort of what people surmise from the fossil record because that's what it looks like. But that's not what evolution is about. For example, um, scientists discover an organism that hasn't evolved in more than 2 billion years. Just a couple of excerpts. Uh, it, an international team of scientists discovered the greatest absence of evolution ever reported a type of deep sea microorganism that appears not to have evolved for over 2 billion years. This lack of evolution supports Darwin's theory, right? Because it's already fit in its environment, no need to change or become more complex. It's already perfectly well adapted. The scientists examine sulfur bacteria microorganisms that are too small to see with the unaided eye that are 1.8 billion years old and were preserved in rocks from Western Australia's coastal waters. Using cutting edge technology, they found that the bacteria looked the same as bacteria of the same region from 2.3 billion years ago. And both sets of these 2 billion year plus old bacteria are indistinguishable 
from modern sulfur bacteria found in mud off the coast of Chile in South America, right? So this total absence of evolution for half of the planet's history um, complex does not mean better. It does not mean wo more well adapted. It does not mean progress, widespread misunderstanding. Complex also has nothing to do, switching back into sort of cultural uh, rather than biological evolution. Complex has nothing to do with the experience of living in a particular society, right? That sort of increased well being or living the good life. That's not necessarily true of complex societies by any means. Um, complex it refers to scale, right? Um, sort of large scale, small scale. It also has nothing to do with the complexity of knowledge or the level of intelligence uh, required to live in that society. Sort of ironically, com in complex societies, simple societies are often accompanied by extremely complex knowledge systems. In um, Nisa and in the film Nye, the filmmakers learned of what, like 90 new plants that they'd never heard of just from their visit with the Kung. Um, extremely complex, intricate, deep ecological knowledge of their environments and other things. While in complex society, many people can get by really not knowing much at all. Um, it's ironic. And so this is the way today that we analytically distinguish between talk about different major types of societies, sort of complex versus simple um, or large scale versus small scale. This is not the way anthropologists started out. Um, so going back sort of to the way it first started, the old division of societies, uh, primitive, versus modern and sort of savage versus civilized. And this is not how we would talk today. This is the history. These labels have are value laden and they have a pejorative connotation. Primitive in relation to what? Civilized in relation to what? Who decides what's primitive and civilized? Do the savages get to decide that, right? No. And they're used, these terms are used to distinguish ourselves um, from other people that are seen as having made little progress towards what the West understands as civilization. It's, neg it's got a negative connotation. It's, it's condescending, it's pejorative, right? Civilized, savage. Um, and these terms emerge in the 19th century, sort of the second half of the 18th hundreds. They come from this sort of outdated but still lingering theory called 19th century cultural evolutionism. And all usually it's also called unilineal evolution. You'll hear me say that more. Um, E.B. Tyler, the, who gave us our definition of culture a few weeks ago, he was a unilineal evolutionist. And so what were these folks all about? What did they say? Remember that cultural anthropology emerges, sort of the field itself develops out of European contact with the rest of the world. Um, you have Europeans coming into contact with other people that look and behave very different from themselves. And so unilineal evolution is this attempt by Europeans initially to explain this diversity. And what they did is they compared everyone else to how closely they match the Europeans' own culture, own society, sort of Judeo-Christian um, white society. It again led to this extremely incorrect ethnocentric way of understanding cultural variation. And the unilineal evolutionists said that all societies pass through the sequence of stages, right? It's linear, unilineal, it goes in a straight line. All societies start out in sort as sort of savages, um, they would consider the savages societies like the Kung, right? These sort of small scale, simple societies, primitives. Again, that's not what I'm saying. This is the unilinealist. I want that to be clear. Um, then eventually, given the right circumstances, uh, societies, savage societies will eventually evolve into barbaric societies, sort of superior than savage societies, but not quite there yet. Um, and ultimately ending in sort of the pinnacle, the highest stage, the most evolved uh, civilization. 
Importantly, the unilineal evolutionists are what we call armchair anthropologists, meaning that they were sort of sitting back in their offices, relying on these secondhand accounts about other cultures, things that were written by missionaries and colonists and other travelers. And then they're reading these secondhand accounts, which are based off opinions, impression, et cetera, versus facts. And then um, coming up with a theory to explain all of sort of humanity around the globe based off these secondhand accounts they're reading in their office. They never actually went out and met or interacted with or saw any of these so-called primitive societies that they were writing about. As you know, in anthropology, that's not one of the hallmark tools, methods in anthropology is to go out and do field work, actually go live with the other, the person that's participating in the research, try to get that emic view. So characteristics of unilineal evolution. It's this idea of progress. Um, that's how they thought about the world. Everything in the universe progresses from sort of simple to complex, more organized, efficient, better. This is unilineal evolution in a straight line. And in this way, humankind also progresses uh, from savagery to civilization. And so here's their hierarchy of societies. <clears throat> Some main concepts. Again, each society progresses from one stage to the next. So everyone starts here in savagery. Um, and if you're lucky, the right circumstances, um, you, you progress into these superior stages. Each subsequent stage represents progress, superiority. Um, <clears throat> so let me give you uh, an example. People in ba peoples and Bailey talk about this. <clears throat> So savage society, um, the unilineal evolutionists would say sort of the Kung, right? Or maybe different Native American groups as Lori just sort of pointed out. Um, barbarism, maybe, maybe also some Native American groups um, with chiefdoms or maybe the Aztecs. Uh, and then civilization, right? Which um, sort of white Europeans. <clears throat> Everyone starts at the bottom um, until you reach the top. So, uh, in the example in the book, Peoples and Bailey talk about religion. They talk about among, um, this is what the unilinealists said, among savage societies, they practice a religion, something called animism. Animism. So it's this idea that everything in nature, in your environment, is imbued with spiritual energy. Um, the rocks, the water, the trees, everything, anim everything's animated with spiritual energy. And so sort of be careful what you do, have respect and reverence for that. It plays out in different ways in different societies. This is incorrect, the unilinealists would say, right? Because they're comparing it to their own monotheistic culture. And so eventually um, some savage societies got smarter, right? And they figured out that not everything is animated with spiritual energy, um, but some things definitely are, right? Like the rain god or... Um, thunder or the winds or some of these more powerful things that maybe have more of an impact on our life than say, um, I, I don't know, certain plant or sort of pebbles or whatever. And so not everything's animated. This is the barbaric stage when people evolve into away from animism and into polytheism, this belief that there's many gods, but not everything's animated with spiritual energy. So you have the God of this, the God of that, that's the barbaric stage. The unilinealists then said, um, they progress eventually into civilization represented by monotheism, right? They sort of, they got smarter and they figured out that there's not actually multiple gods. Um, there's just one true God. And to worship other gods would be to worship false idols, right? And so sort of from animism in the savage society, got a little smarter, moved into the barbaric stage. Um, polytheism characterizes that. And then when they finally fully evolved, progressed into the most superior in-state civilization, um, they had figured out monotheism was the, was the one right way, right? This is unilineal evolution. Also, civilized society has more useful technology and it promotes more happiness. People are, duh, obviously better off, happier in complex civilized society. And of course, um, we're smarter, right? Not we, um, I'm not part of civilization. Civilized society is also the most intelligent. <clears throat> Who's on top? 
right? White Europeans, of course, the people that were writing this crap. And the reason they also say the reason that we have today, we have civilized societies, but also barbaric ones and savages like the Kung still around or the Yanomamo is because they just they evolved at a slower rate. They just not enough time has gone by for them to progress um, to the stage that we have reached. Unilineal evolution progresses in a line through these stages. Um, each stage represents superiority until you get to the pinnacle uh, represented by Europeans, the people again, writing this crap. Okay, so unilineal evolutionists, everything progresses in this um, straight line. How did Europeans make it to the top? how they progress quickest? The unilinealists said, because they're the most intelligent, they're the smartest. Why? How did Europeans become more intelligent? And what they said was the environment. Some environments were more stimulating than others. Savages have a chance if you just put them in the right environments, the stimulating ones. Guess what the stimulating environments are? Um, the temperate zones, the places where white Europeans live, right? What they said is these are the areas most conducive to the elaboration of civilization. Um, specifically, they ascribed the effects of climate on human social variation. So they said hot climates lead to passionate, lazy people that fail to build culture. Extremely cold, dark climates lead to morose people, meaning morose, sort of grumpy, right? Um, sulky and just not in a good mood. Temperate environments are most conducive to the elaboration of civilization. Problems with this. Can anyone think of a problem with this idea that the sort of complex civilized society is made it because they're the smartest and they're the smartest because they were in the right environment, the temperate environments? Where do the first um, sort of complex societies, the first civilizations actually emerge. Um, so if you look, it ignores where all of the earliest civilizations arose. Um, oh, and I don't mean homo sapiens, I mean um, like farming societies. So what we consider complex society with literacy, farming, et cetera. It ignores where they all first popped up and it's all in hot and subtropical regions. Um, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Indus Valley, Mesoamerica, the Aztecs, the Inca, coastal Peru. And it also ignores, it can't deal um, with reality. So it can't deal with the occurrence of different types of societies that are in the exact same environment, simultaneously or sequentially. So simultaneously, and you're reading in Nisa right now, they have the Kunger there and the Kalahari, but so are the Herero. So are other types of societies that are not hunter-gatherers. So the explanation can't deal with the fact that different societies occur in the exact same type of environment. And if you look through the archeological record through time sequentially, that also reveals that you can have different types of societies from hunter-gatherers to farmers to industrial societies, all in the exact same spot, but just throughout time. Right, so it just doesn't hold up. Okay, so the unilinealists, they are so incorrect in their thinking, but they did have a contribution, which is that they actually attributed differences between societies to um, identifiable cultural processes rather than biology or sort of divine intervention. So people, societies are different not because they're biologically superior or inferior because of race, that's not true. And they're not uh, superior or inferior because of divine intervention, because they're sort of God's chosen people. It is through um, the environment, through the surroundings they're subjected to, through what they learn, that is what shapes the differences. Although not in the way the unilinealists tried to explain. That's what we'll cover in terms of the history of anthropological thought. That brings us to um, almost contemporary day. At the turn of the 19th century, different ideas started to emerge about cultural differences. Franz Boas 
called the father of American anthropology because his theoretical and methodological con contributions to the field were so impactful then and still continue to underpin much of what we do today.